Senate is yet to agree on a coronavirus relief package as the economy remains in turmoil. Joining us now to discuss the latest is Josh Barrow. He is a business columnist for New York Magazine and host of KCWR's Left, Right and Center and an old friend of mine. Great to see you, Josh. Absolutely good to be here. Thanks, Josh. So I have a lot of things I want to ask you about, but let's start with um, the Senate bill, which, you know, has failed at this point. They sort of went back to the drawing board over the provisions around which industries should be bailed out and how. Um, just sort of explain what's going on there and what you think is the right course of action. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the concern, obviously, it's, it's similar to what happened with TARP back in 2008, which is that when you have a crisis like this and, and part of the strategy for getting the economy through the crisis is to support specific enterprises through it so that they don't fold, uh, you may end up giving a lot of discretion uh, to the executive branch about how to hand out that money. And I think there are good reasons that Democrats are reluctant to trust uh, the Trump administration with a task like that. And also asking questions about, you know, what the, what the amount of money is that's truly necessary for that. Obviously, there, there are also big disputes about other aspects of the package, including Democrats want more support for state and local governments. I think people haven't quite focused yet on the extent to which state and local governments will be and are being crushed by this in much the same way that businesses are. Um, if you run a transit agency, people aren't paying fares right now because they're not riding. You're probably also financed by things like sales taxes, maybe property transaction taxes. Those things aren't happening right now. Uh, so I think that there, there's a reasonable fight happening over, the, over exactly how to distribute this money. And frankly, I don't think taking a day or two to work out those disputes is that big a problem. Now, this is an urgent matter. Uh, they need to do something very quickly. But I think that there's been a part of the conversation that has basically said, you know, well, you, you can't you can't take any more time fighting over this. You need to pass something. I don't think there's a problem with taking a day or two to get this right. And my hope is that that's what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Josh, I always wanted to ask you, because you had a recent column where you talked about how we may be too pessimistic about the pandemic response. I found mm -hmm. it really interesting, which is what are the steps that we need to get back into place in order to get some of the economy working again vis-a-vis -a, -vis a shutdown? Because we're seeing reports literally live right now that the president and many of his advisors believe that they need to get the economy working and spinning back up again. If that were to be the case, how do we get back to a point where we won't be locked inside for months on end if the government can get its act together? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think those reports this morning about the thinking inside the White House are very worrying. And now I think it is a correct I think it is a correct observation to say that we can't do a shutdown like this forever and to say that that shutting down so much of the economy uh, is enormously costly to the economy will will hurt ordinary people a lot and, and ultimately will cost some lives. Uh, if you have to have a shutdown that long. But the, but the White House sort of has the op order of operations backwards. You have to get to a place where the shutdown is no longer necessary so that you can lift parts of it. Whereas it sounds like the president's thinking is basically, you know, this shutdown can't go on so long. We need to lift it at the beginning of April, uh, which you can't do uh, if you don't have the, the measures in place so that you don't have to have the most stringent measures. Now, two things have to happen before you can move to a new strategy. One is that you have to stop the acute uh, epidemic which has not happened yet in places like Washington and California and especially New York where I live. Uh, so, you know, the, it, it doesn't have to go on for months and months necessarily. That doesn't mean that you can lift the restrictions after just a couple of weeks. It's going to take somewhat more time than that, certainly, and it also depends on, on factors we don't know about. Uh, once you have the epidemic more under control, it should be possible to take more measures of the sort that we're seeing in some of the East Asian countries that have had more success controlling this outbreak, which is to say South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, that are very focused on tracking individual people. You do a lot of testing to figure out who is carrying the coronavirus. You require them to isolate themselves. Uh, and so basically you stop transmissions at the individual level and you do not have to rely as much on population level measures. Now I would note you still need some population level measures and those are still disruptive to the economy. And also this, you know, we're learning as we go. This has mixed efficacy. We've seen some worrying numbers actually in recent days out of, out of, out of Singapore and Hong Kong as there's been an increase in the, in the number of cases. So those strategies are not necessarily going to be perfect. And in some cases you may lift some restrictions and then need to put them back on later. Uh, because uh, an epidemic will, will rise again in a, in a certain place. So I, I, think it, I think it is true. Scott Gottlieb, the former head of the FDA, has been talking a lot about, you know, we, we didn't prepare for March and January. We need to be prepared for May now. Uh, and some of the, those things that we need to stand up, those are the things that we're going to need to be able to do that in May. But again, he's talking about May, not April. Um, and we haven't stood those things up yet. So I'm very worried that the White House is going to actually start prematurely releasing on some of these restrictions that I, I understand are very painful for the economy. But if you release them and you don't have this stuff in place, you're going you're, you're to have you know, 
potentially millions of deaths. And not only is that going to be terrible from a human uh, human perspective, that's not going to fix the economy either. Even if you take off some of these restrictions, if you have an uncontrolled pandemic out there and lots of people dying, I mean, for one thing, that will still tremendously interrupt business activity. Lots of people won't be working. So even if your narrow goal is to push the stock market back up, I, I don't think that's going to work either. That's right. Because, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that most people are staying home, businesses are closed, et cetera, not because the federal government is telling them to. I mean, some states have issued those sort of shutdown measures. But a lot of this is people wanting to be safe, wanting to keep right. to prohibit the spread, not wanting to get it themselves or to infect their loved ones. So some of that is, is honestly out of the federal government's hands anyway. Um, I wanted to get more of your thoughts on sort of which industries we should be thinking about bailing out. Obviously, American people are first and foremost interested in making sure that the American people are going to be okay through all of this, are going to be able to survive, are not going to have big credit hits, are not going to have get foreclosed on, evicted, et cetera, et cetera. But some industries are essential. Which do you think should be bailed, bailed down? And what do you think the strings attached should be as we're thinking that through? Right. Well, I mean, there's sort of two questions here, right? One is which industries need rescues, and the other is what should those rescues look like? I mean, what we need is we need a, a certain enterprises to keep operating. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need certain support for the equity owners of their enterprises. In fact, in some cases, the value of the equity, the shares can go to zero. You can go through bankruptcy or a bankruptcy-like process. You know, because I mean, for example, we need to continue to have airlines. We can't be in a situation where airlines shut down because there is so there's so little demand that none of the routes are profitable. There are certain essential things that need to operate, uh, even in this context where most people should not be traveling. And then when we are starting the economy back up again, we want to be able to sort of take the airlines out of the box and have the planes start flying again, which is a problem if the airlines have, have ceased operations. Now, that said, I mean, airlines operate in bankruptcy all the time. Uh, American, Delta, and United have all been bankrupt within the last 15 years, um, and they flew through bankruptcy. So just because we need a, a program to keep the airlines running, that doesn't necessarily mean we need a program that gives grants to the equity owners of the airlines. Now, that, that could end up being the, the best way to do it. I mean, in the case of the auto bailouts, Mitt Romney's position fam famously was put the, the auto companies through bankruptcy. That was one of the, the issues that cost him the 2012 election, I think. Um, but his view wasn't that we shouldn't have auto companies. It was that we should put them through bankruptcy. The Obama uh, administration position was, no, that's going to be too disruptive to the economy. We need a bespoke bailout for them, which is what we did for GM and Chrysler. Uh, so I think that that's going to be, to some extent, a case-by-case -case basis. My, my view is actually that, that that shouldn't be job one in this response, that we have some time. We're going to see over the next few weeks what the needs of those specific large businesses are, and we could come back and do more legislation later. Um, I'm more concerned right now about support at the individual level. I want people to be able to still pay their mortgages, pay their rent. Um, I think that, you know, in addition to, to supporting uh, families through this crisis, I think that's going to be necessary for maintaining compliance uh, with economically costly distancing orders. You know, people are more likely to stay home when you tell them to if they have money and they know that they can pay their rent and they don't really absolutely need to work today. And then I'm concerned about small businesses. One of the most impacted sectors is going to be restaurants. Restaurants do not sit on a lot of cash in most cases, independent ones. They, 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 they literally can't maintain their payroll for, for long periods through, of closure. And a lot of them will be forced to, to close, unable to make payments on their equipment, on their rent. Uh, and then who knows if they'll open once this once this is all over. So I think that that's, you know, that, that one of the more bipartisan areas in this response has been the need for, for assistance of that sort through the Small Business Administration. You can have structures, uh, you could have structures where you make loans to those businesses and then if they meet certain criteria in terms of keeping people on the payroll, you forgive those loans afterward. I think that is an approach that makes a certain amount of sense. But I mean, in terms of sectors, you're obviously gonna see hospitality, transportation, energy is hard hit. Um, although, you know, the, I think that uh, we, the energy sector in terms of, of fracking in the United States, there, there's already an expectation that prices are going to go up and go down that's built into that industry. Um, but, so the, but, you know, in, in a market where, 35, where the stock market's down 35 percent, where we're talking about things like a, you know, minus 24 percent annualized growth rate in the second quarter, according, according to Goldman Sachs, it's hitting basically every sector in one right. way or another. Yeah, right. great point. Yeah, so well said. And Josh, just elaborate on that that one point you made, which I think you just wrote a piece about, which is that economic stimulus isn't just about economic stimulus. It's also about making sure people actually comply with the measures that are put in place to try to stop the pandemic. Just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, this has been tough in week one here in New York, right? I mean, schools closed a week ago today. 
Um, and, you know, life is, is very strange here in New York. And a lot of people have been thrown out of their jobs. I mean, life isn't as tough for me as it is for most people in New York. I'm doing my job from home. Um, and while it is, you know, emotionally jarring, I still have my income. Um, but a lot of people um, have been thrown out of their work. They don't know what's going to happen to them. They're scared about this virus. But eventually you're going to reach a point where people don't have money for groceries. They don't have money for rent. Um, and they are wondering, as is, as is natural to wonder, is all of this really necessary? Um, do, you know, did this thing that is, has so upended my life and my financial life, did it have to be done? Why can't I go to work? Why can't I find a way to have my livelihood? And I think eventually the, the impulse for people is going to be, you know, I want to go out. Either I want to go out and find a way to earn a living or I want to go out and see my friends. Um, and in order to maintain that social cohesion, people understanding, no, this thing that is very unpleasant and very expensive, we have to keep doing it. I think it's going to be a lot easier to get that, um, that, that uh, cooperation if people have money that is making their lives at least as financially normal as possible during this period when everything else is very weird. I think the, I think the main vehicle to do that through is the unemployment insurance system. We have a system that sends checks to people who lose their jobs, but those checks need to be bigger and they need right. to be more flexible. I mean, you have some people who remain technically attached to their employers for good reasons. Maybe they're still on their health insurance. We want people when this is all lifted to basically go back into the jobs they were in before instead of having a really costly thing where everyone goes out and finds something new to do. So we want people to maintain those employer links. We don't want that to stand in the way of them getting a larger unemployment insurance check. So again, that's you know that's something the that Congress has already been working on. Um, but I think that's going to be the central part of that uh, of that measure, not only to keep the economy normal, but to keep people willing to cooperate with uh, with these rules. I yeah. think that's an excellent excellent point about you know fiscal stimulus here is both a virus killer, as you put it, and it's not just right. necessarily an economic bailout. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insight. So great to have you, Josh. Sure, thank thank you. you. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. We'll have more rising for you right after this.